Thank you, Jackson. Um, second, getting things in order on my end. So properly, officially, thank you and welcome everyone. Um, thank you all for being here. This is um, the final lecture in the Spaces of Containment and Care lecture series. Um, and as some of you know, this series, um, in this series, we've been looking at the spatial politics of health and disease. And my name is Nida Rahman. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Architecture at CMU. This series is supported by the CMU Center for Arts and Society, um, where I'm currently directing a three-year project under the initiatives and under an initiative called Borderlines. And I'm Absolutely delighted to welcome Tish Lopez. Um, Dr. Lopez is an assistant professor at, the, at Dartmouth College in the Department of Geography. And her work is situated at the intersections of historical and contemporary geographies of health and disease, racial capitalism and empire, and care and care ethics. She has published two edited volumes with Dr. Catherine Gillespie, uh, one of them is called Economies of Death, Economic Logics of Killable Life. And the other one is Grievable Death and Vulnerable Witness, The Politics of Grief in the Field. And she's currently working with Dr. Abigail Neely on a multi-fold research project, which examines the impact of COVID-19 on care and care labor. And over this last week, I have been um, reading and rereading this excellent article, which is entitled Fundamentally Uncaring, the Differential Multiscalar Impacts of COVID-19 in the US, which they published earlier this year um, in Social Science and Medicine, is that correct? Okay. Um, which I am going to provide a link to. It's an excellent article and I highly recommend it. Um, as the title suggests, this article traces the converging crises of the pandemic and structural racism and government abandonment that we've seen across this last year or so, um, and how these have created the uneven conditions for disease transmission. But it also offers, in the end, a message of hope of how social movements, and particularly the movement for Black lives, has pushed public discourse towards an ethics of care. And I was finishing reading this or, or for the second time this week on, on Tuesday, and it strongly, the message here strongly resonates after Tuesday's verdict in the Chauvin trial, um, which offered some renewed hope, even as the very brutal murder of the young Makia Bryant served as a very tough reminder that real change has yet to come. So I'm really grateful. Um, to Tish for being here with us this week to offer us insights and tools to think through this moment together. So before I pass it on to her, I do want to ask everyone to just make sure that their mics are muted for the duration of the lecture. Uh, but please do feel free to use the chat function to ask questions and we'll have time after the lecture for discussion. Um, and we're recording this talk, which we'll make available on the Center for Arts and Society YouTube channel um, in a few days. So with that, please uh, join me for a really warm welcome for Tish Lopez. Uh, thank you so much for that generous introduction. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and flip over to slides. Uh, bear with me. Um, and I also just need to make a very quick comment. Um, I have a tiny terror of a cat on my desk. So if I start to squirm or make noises or he does, just FYI, that's what's going on. I sort of feel like I need to forewarn you. Um, so before I begin, uh, I, I did want to begin by acknowledging that as I speak, I'm actually situated on land that has been tended for centuries by the Abeniki and Mahican, um, uh, a land which was taken from them uh, in the 1610s uh, by force. And so I would like to ask that we pay our respects to these and other indigenous uh, stewards of the lands and waters in Vermont and to the indigenous peoples, wherever we are each individually situated, um, especially in the time of COVID, we tend to be a little more scattered 
mattered. Um, and I want to invite you all to share in the chat where you were located um, and to acknowledge the Indigenous peoples who have lived in the places where we each are um, and who live here now and who will live here in the future. Um, I always feel it's really important um, moving into um, sort of a necessary step to make this acknowledgement as you work to de decolonize um, uh, spaces engaged in knowledge production. So thank you, uh, Nita Roman and the Carnegie Mellon University Center for Arts and Society for this invitation to speak today. I'm very happy to be here. Um, and thank you also, I don't know if Karen Weingartner is on here. I know sometimes it's difficult to get these things organized. Um, and finally, I wanna thank all of you in the audience. I realize um, I figured you were all coming up to the end of your term. Um, and importantly, um, the end of a long year of isolation and quarantine and struggle. Um, as well as the immense turmoil that we've all been experiencing over the past few weeks um, with the continued um, violence, uh, anti-Asian violence and anti-Black violence, and then the uh, verdict on Tuesday. Um, and as uh, my colleague Abby Neely put it, um, well, as important as that verdict uh, is, um, it doesn't mean that the system is working. Um, and that real justice, um, speaking from uh, Alicia Garza, uh, would be for George Floyd to be alive and thriving. This talk stems from a series of conversations that um, an ongoing research that I've been doing with Dr. Abigail Neely, also at, um, at Car uh, at Dartmouth College um, since March, 2020. So I, I think it was like February 28th, she called me, um, was like, we need to do this. There's a project here. I can't concentrate, you can't concentrate. Um, we began this project while I was on sabbatical in Seattle, trying to do research for something completely different. And my city um, had come to a screeching halt over uh, about 110,000 people stopped going to work suddenly uh, by the end of the second week of March. Meanwhile, here in the Upper Valley, which is situated on the Vermont, New Hampshire border where um, Professor Neely was uh, in, in at that moment, nothing had changed, right? There was sort of this almost sense of serenity and, and the bucolic rural New England sense, uh, sort of sensibility was still rolling by. That would change very quickly by the end of spring term. They also shut down and the students um, thought they'd come back and then um, have not been back, were not back until this past fall. What was really clear from the beginning was that um, this pandemic and its impacts were going to be experienced in wildly different ways. And there's this idea being circulated that we're all in this together um, that seemed to us in that moment to be just one more way in which differential experiences of some would be flattened by, um, uh, by those who profess to speak for all, right? This is something that we see repeatedly and in particular in those early days of the rich and sometimes also famous tweeting about their isolation and loneliness on things like these giant yachts out in the Caribbean while I was in a 400 square foot apartment <laughs> in Seattle. Um, but more importantly, you know, much of the essential labor and also the non-essential but public facing labors in the US are performed by low income workers who are disproportionately black, brown, indigenous and Asian folks, as well as women and uh, migrants. Um, and they often perform this labor without appropriate protective equipment and all while contending with a small but vociferous and growing minority of people uh, who refuse or are unwilling to comply with disease mitigation um, guidelines. Um, and of course, this map right here was just posted yesterday by the New York Times, these three maps um, showing sort of the different ways in which um, states in this moment are actually managing uh, mitigation efforts. Um, more broadly. Um, and that's really uh, just doing all of this sort of opening up despite um, the immense uncertainty that we're facing in this moment, uh, particularly around the overall impacts that the vaccines are going to have, but also who is going to get those vaccines. Feminist theorists um, and care geographers have long highlighted the uneven distribution of care labors that run along gender, race, immigration status, and class lines. Um, this is labor that is and continues to be deeply undervalued, underpaid, often unpaid, um, and is pushed to the margins of the so-called productive capitalism, right, in these conversations around labor. And while this pandemic de-invisibilized much of this labor, um, very little came of this de-invisibilization beyond some um, sort of uh, forms of recognition. Um, and we're going to talk about what some of those were um, as we go forward. <clears throat> 
it was also made very clear very early um, that certain comorbidities, which are experienced at much higher rates among Black, Indigenous, and people of color, as well as immigrants, um, were going to lead to uh, heavier morbidity and mortality rates among the already medically disenfranchised in the United States, bearing down as it did on the bodies of Black, Indigenous, and people of color. But it wasn't until The Atlantic published an article by Ibram X. Kendi in April, uh, pointing out that even the CDC was not keeping racial and ethnic data, that we began to understand just how immense um, this unevenness was becoming. Um, he wondered, uh, Kendi did, uh, somewhat presciently, and this is a quote, maybe some people fear that if racial data were to show that COVID-19 is disproportionately harming people of color, then white people will stop caring. This double burden, the outsized impacts on the social and economic lives through the heightened exposure of black, brown, indigenous, and Asian folks, and the intensified severity of illness of death and death are not accidents of the disease. Um, rather, these have been co-produced by a very long history of structural racism and racial capitalism in the US, beginning with settler colonialism and slavery and continuing through its many transformations from Jim Crow to contemporary undercompensated and undocumented labor. Um, um, and this is a purposeful de devaluation in the United States that is not simply about the feminization of labor and particularly of care labors, um, but it's also bound up in uh, anti-Black racism and xenophobia um, as codified through legislation such as the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938. Um, and this Fair Labor Standards Act um, coming out of the New Deal period um, you know, intended originally FYI to only be a 30 hour work week. Um, we got stuck with 40, um, but it also set the, um, the floor for income, but Southern states banded together to push for number one, the 40 hour work week, but more importantly, that domestic labor, which preponderantly were, um, was performed by black women and agricultural labor preponderantly performed by black men and tipped uh, labor also preponderantly performed um, by um, people of color um, would be left out of those regulations. And we're still seeing that today in things like the fight for 15 um, and the fight for uh, protections for domestic labor um, more broadly across the country. So it's from within sort of all of these conversations and consternations that this talk emerges. Um, some of this talk uh, comes from and is a continuation of the shape and contours of the article that some of you read today and, um, and that Nita actually shared with us um, from Social Science and Medicine. And thank you to those who read it. Um, but what you'll hear today actually builds on that article and moves into the work of another article that we have written that is also currently under review. Um, because what happened was in the midst of writing, excuse me, that article, we realized that there was far more to unpack um, with regard to the entanglements of uh, racial capitalism, political ecologies of health and disease, and these geographies of care. Um, and in particular, what we realized were the ways in which these literatures are not generally in conversation and therefore um, often fail where we need them most to do the work of unpacking, not just this moment, but also longer histories of racialized violence that moves through these multiple scales along the individual social and political bodies. And the one caveat to that um, obviously is going to be in environmental justice. Um, there has been quite a lot of work done in political ecologies, political ecology broadly, sort of looking at these intersections of racial capitalism um, and health and disease. Um, so what I'm, I'm presenting here really is um, sort of the strands um, of thought and articulations that we've been pulling at, um, sort of the threads and knots, if you will, of these critical political ecologies of health and disease together with racial capitalism and care geographies in order to interrogate um, uh, both the racialization of the disease itself and the ways in which racial capitalism has actually fostered this disproportionate burden among Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, not as something that's anomalous, um, but as the outcome of the deep entrenchment of white supremacy in the U.S. So in doing this, we are very cognizant of Lauro Pulido's caution, um, and this is a quote, that most of us examine racial outcomes without considering racial production. And focusing on a particular racial or ethnic group rather than racial capitalism per se may lead to improved conditions for some, but it overlooks capitalism's incessant need to actively produce difference somewhere. 
So centuries of this productive, our production as we show here, arise materially, biomedically, affectively, and socially, um, structuring crises that are unmistakably fractured along these lines of difference making. So I wanted to start today by giving you a sense of the landscape. And I realize being the last of your series, um, you've probably seen a variety of these data, um, but I just, for those of you who haven't, I kind of wanted to give a brief overview. I am about to do exactly and precisely what I'm gonna start this talk and I'm gonna end this talk by suggesting we do not do, which is sort of this flattening um, of the sort of um, understanding who is being impacted by the disease. But I also realize, um, that the specificities of these experiences across the country are, are really important to unpack. Um, so across the US, as you can see from this chart, and hopefully it's clear, but the orange is hospitalizations, blue is deaths, the gray are cases. So these are total cases of COVID. Um, uh, Latinx, Black, and, um, and Black Americans um, have about three times the mortality rates of uh, white and Asian Americans. Um, and this chart actually shows this a little bit differently. We're gonna talk about why in just a minute. Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders and um, uh, indigenous and Native American and Alaska Natives have seen rates as high as 10 times as high as uh, whites and Asians in this country. Um, as you can see here, uh, there is some data missing um, and hence the sort of foreshortening of some of these lines um, to, you know, out to just four times as, not just, but out to four times as um, high case rates and deaths and hospitalizations. So for instance, um, several states do not collect data about Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders in their demographic health data. So we're not really sure what the total caseload is nationwide. Um, and also the hospitalizations and deaths um, are our best guess drawn from several sources. So this is true also of Native American and indigenous numbers um, where some states don't keep this data. Um, other, in some situations, medical personnel uh, make best guesses, guesses of um, racial identities. And it's um, been documented multiple times that Native American and indigenous um, people are often misentered as white. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna talk about this in just a minute, uh, that there is some accounting happening within indigenous and Native American communities um, that are happening separately from the state. So in Washington state, um, rates of confirmed cases for Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander people were nine times higher than for those of white people and hospitalizations were 10 times that of white people last July. And the numbers were the most dramatic in Spokane County. And you can see this in the left-hand side in the red, um, the red is the county that I'm talking about, Spokane, um, where people from the Marshall Islands make up less than 1% of the country's population, but they represent about 30% of confirmed COVID cases. In Arkansas, as you can see on the right side of the screen, um, uh, Pacific Islanders are 0.3% of the population, and yet they account for 8% of the COVID-19 cases. Um, and here in Benton and Washington counties, the two counties in that um, upper left-hand corner, Marshallese are estimated to make up between 1.5 and 3% of the total population, accounted for 19% of all COVID-19 deaths in the region, and 38% of deaths. Um, again, here we see in the first wave in Louisiana, more than 70% of the people who died from COVID-19 were black, uh, which is more than twice their 32% share of the state's population and well above the 60% share of the population of New Orleans where um, the outbreak was the worst. So that's uh, the red area again. Um, and um, in Milwaukee County, right there again in the red in Wisconsin, black people make up 67% of the COVID-19 deaths despite being just 27% of the population. Um, and this is a recent, this is, uh, these numbers are from, um, on the right hand side are from April 2021 from Sulul America um, are showing sort of the disparities that we are seeing across the country in terms of Latinx people who are hospitalized. Um, in Washington state, again, Latinx are 13% of the population, but make up 31% of the cases in California. 39.3% of the population, but 55% of the cases. And a lot of this has been attributed to um, the um, sort of overcrowded and unsafe working conditions of uh, uh, people within our foodway, um, uh, foodways industries, if you will. All right, and then finally, this is from um, a project between APM and The Guardian. 
Um, so nationwide, they did this a little bit differently. It's one in every 475 uh, Native American and Alaska Natives have died from COVID since the start of the pandemic, um, as compared to uh, one in 825 white Americans. Um, there are 574 federally recognized um, uh, American Indian tribes and Alaska Native villages. Um, and the Navajo Nation, which is the second largest and spans the, the four corner states there in the sort of the darker colors, um, uh, is the second largest by population and it suffered the greatest losses by number. But proportionally, indigenous people in Mississippi um, have died of COVID-19 uh, at the highest rates of one in every um, 127. All right, so I want us to keep in mind as I'm going through the, um, this lecture that black, brown, indigenous and Asian Americans and migrants make up the largest portion of medical staff. Um, and, you know, we've been celebrating nurses and doctors, um, you know, banging on pots um, and pans and shouting and singing um, delightfully in, in uh, Seattle it was every single night at 8 p.m. Um, but it's worth remembering that doctors and nurses only make up about 20% of the total healthcare force. And so the remaining essential workers in the healthcare industry, so this includes nursing assistants, orderlies, phlebotomists, pharmacy assistants, home health aides, housekeepers, janitors, medical assistants, cooks, you know, all of that set of background work. They make up 80% of that of the healthcare industry. Um, and they earn far less than a living wage. About 20% live in poverty and more than 40% rely on some form of public assistance. Um, and many were working, especially at the beginning, but also continue to do now um, without adequate protective equipment. It's also worth noting that 81% of um, uh, the health industry is staffed by women, um, of whom 25% are um, Black women and 21% uh, uh, are Latina. And between 15 and 22% are, are immigrant, and that's uh, women. And so it's a little bit difficult to get a firm grasp on that number, um, given the sort of turnover, et cetera. All right. So I'm going to sort of wanted to set the landscape so that as I move through this, you've got some contours through which to think about this. And so for the rest of this talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce these um, political ecologies of health and then start to think about racial capitalism and come back and bring them into conversation together before we move on to thinking about geographies of care. And I do want to circle back at the end um, again to think through and with the raptures and protests that have punctuated the pandemic and sort of leave us with some questions to ask ourselves about how we're going to remember um, this time and um, sort of moving forward about thinking more care ethically together. So political ecologies of health um, have really brought the focus on health and disease out of sort of the sole purview, if you will, of biomedical processes of the body to encompass what Madison Barber and Julie Guthman have called the external political and structural conditions that make certain populations vulnerable to disease, end quote. As Brian King outlines, political ecology uh, assists in showing how health is situated within political, economic, cultural, and environmental systems that intersect to shape the spread of disease and decision-making options available to human populations. And in fact, a critical political ecology of health and disease necessarily not only moves beyond this biomedical construction of disease, but it also takes seriously, as Lafferty puts it, the histories that produced inequality in resource access and wealth in the construction of racial difference. Which is to say that individual bodies are entangled with social and political bodies produced in and productive of environments, socio-political processes, and racial capitalism, and they must be understood as such. So in drawing on racial capitalism, we are centering this differential illness and death of Black, Indigenous, and people of color due to COVID-19 within these longer histories of capital expropriation and exploitation. Theorists of racial capitalism have long argued that capitalist accumulation from its inception has been dependent upon the vulnerability and disposability of particularly racialized bodies. And in fact, racism is a structuring logic of capitalism, as Lauro Pulido puts it. And it builds through this expansion of empire, right? So as Real Ruth Wilson Gilmer puts it, um, capitalism requires inequality and racism enshrines it. So racial capitalism at once renders subjects vulnerable to hyper exploitation and expropriation in the economic domain and vulnerable to premature death in the political and social domains, as Jackie Wang puts it. 
So as such, um, we want to remember as we're moving through this that racial capitalism is not simply a descriptor of the ways in which race and capitalism intersect, but rather it's an insistence that capitalism has always been relational and always been predicated on racial difference. Capitalism and racism are co-constituted. So in highlighting the impacts of racial capitalism in relation to COVID-19, uh, what we're trying to do first and foremost is push back against the tendencies within biomedicine to search for clues for differential health and disease among racialized subjects in, for instance, genomic sequencing, um, uh, which in turn simply reifies the social constructions of racial difference. And here we're thinking with Dorothy Roberts, um, Alondra Nelson, and Anthony Hatch. We're also pushing back against the pathologization of individuals' habits as moral failures, um, such as when US Surgeon General Jerome Adams invoked Big Mama and Abuela in his calls to Black and Latinx people to reduce smoking, drug use, and drinking, uh, despite the fact that uh, we know that whites engage in these activities at levels equal to or greater than people of color. Rather, what we are concerned with here um, is what Arlene Geronimus and others have called weathering or the cumulative effects of inequality and racism on the health of African-Americans specifically and on people of color generally. She tells us that quote, on a physiological level, persistent high effort coping with acute and chronic stressors can have a profound effect on health. The stress inherent in living in a race conscious society that stigmatizes and disadvantages black, brown, indigenous and Asian folks may cause disproportionate physiological deterioration, marking their biological ages far older than their chronological age. Which is to say that the high prevalence of the very comorbidities that make a COVID-19 infection far more severe and more likely to kill so particularly the metabolic conditions such as cardiovascular disease, overweight or obesity, type two diabetes and hypertension among black indigenous and people of color in the US are not simply the outcomes of biomedical materiality but are what Shepard Hughes and Locke call the dimensions of human distress, distress or the social relations of sickness, right? And this we know has been compounded by the well-documented disparities in access to quality of and satisfaction with health care for Black, Indigenous, and people of color, as well as immigrants. And further, um, that BIPOC and immigrants are less likely to have health insurance. They take much longer to seek medical care and attention, and when they do, are less likely to have their signs and symptoms taken seriously. Um, and since the start of the pandemic, um, have been less likely to be administered a COVID test. So the weather and weathering, Christina Sharp insists, transforms black being. To weather structural racism, the productive powers of settler colonial racial capitalism is to contend with, quote, the weather in which anti-blackness is pervasive as climate. The weather necessitates changeability and improvisation. It is the atmospheric condition of time and place. It produces new ecologies, she tells us. So these ecologies are both internal and external, and they are held hostage to the social, psychological, and physical environmental surround, right? The subtle that stretches its tentacles into the body and the overt that elicits the somatic response of affect settling into the psyche and into the metabolic functions of the body. The subtle emerges in the everyday, in the microaggression, in the caution, in the heightened anxieties that are all linked to survival. The link between biomarkers and social measures as seen in cortisol levels, sympathetic nerve activity, blood pressure reactivity, cytokine production, and glycated hemoglobin levels, which have all been uh, associated with and related to socioeconomic status, occupation, birth outcome, and environmental risk. Um, and as a recent article by Nichols and Del Casino um, has argued, the body is, quote, ontologically co-constituted through the power-laden relations with more than human actors. So, for instance, microbes, nutrients, air, as well as these affective and uh, non-representable forces, um, such as the affective and somatic. The microbiome, made up as it is of um, billions of organisms essential for the body to function, is held in a delicate balance buffeted by biosocial relationships to the dynamic processes of embodiment, 
And this microbial ecology is made up of more microbial cells and genes than human ones, and has been shown to be both impacted by and to impact stress responses entangled in biosocial worlds and ecology within an ecology. Externally and materially, racial capitalism is fundamental to ecologies of resource extraction, processing and disposal. So in the US, race is the most significant predictor of a person living near contaminated air, water, or soil. And people of color constitute 56% of the population living near toxic waste sites. Communities of color are more likely to be exposed to nitrogen dioxide air pollutants. And while exposure to any air pollution lowers our ability to fight off infection and worsens reactions to viruses in people with health challenges such as asthma, um, an early study about COVID-19 found that nitrogen dioxide pollution specifically may be one of the most important contributors to fatality caused by the COVID-19 virus. So it's not enough to say then, as Brian King does, that disease vulnerability is connected to environmental factors um, and is demonstrated by the concept of environmental justice can be tied to race, ethnicity, class, and other social categories that experience differential exposure to unhealthy conditions. But that what we're arguing for is to stretch this thinking toward engagement with racial capitalism in order to, as Polito asserts, focus a greater attention to the essential processes that shaped the modern world, such as colonization, primitive accumulation, slavery, and imperialism, by insisting that we are still living with the legacy of these processes. Racial capitalism requires that we place contemporary forms of racial inequality in a materialist, ideological and historical framework, and that we begin from the stance that racial capitalism produces this differential exposure. So as we move to think through racial capitalism's role um, in the political ecology of COVID-19, our attention turns to the social ontology of relationality. Uh, if this disease has really done nothing else, it has highlighted the ways in which we're all interconnected entangled even if we're not really all in this together. Our collective ability to survive this pandemic is dependent upon the healthcare workers who care for sick individuals, the essential workers who have kept the shelves stocked, our packages arriving, our food waste moving, and then also upon all of us to take seriously mitigation protocols. My health is dependent upon your willingness and ability to wear a mask, keep your distance, wash your hands, get vaccinated, just as yours is dependent upon the same for me. And yet at root of racial capitalism is, as Jody Melamed tells us, a technology of anti-relationality, a technology for reducing collective life to the relations that sustain capitalism. So it insists upon this production of differential values, a kind of differentiation through negation. Stepping out of this then, we actually, we find Fisher and Toronto's definition of care particularly generative for moving forward. Um, they write, and it's here on the slide, on the most general level, we suggest that caring be viewed as a species activity that includes everything that we do to maintain, continue and re repair our world so that we can live in it as well as possible. That world includes our bodies, ourselves, and our environment, all of which we seek to interweave in a complex life-sustaining web. So under this rubric, care encompasses all the ways that we can imagine, define, and mobilize it as a complex set of emotionally felt experiences, bodily practices, and social politics that connect people, place, and things, as Morrison has recently pointed. So care under this rubric that encompasses all of these things. So as an affective response, then um, it means to care is what we feel when we want to intercede in the service of others, in the service of the needs of others. Um, but to essentialize the affective dimensions of care to altruism is to sincerely miss the ways in which caring activities elicit a wide range of emotions. Um, as Liz Bondi uh, argued in her 2008 paper, Care oppresses and inspires, it hurts and it nurtures, it demands and it fulfills, it enrages and it moves, it evokes love and it evokes hate. 
Relationships of care are necessarily reciprocal, manifesting at times as intimate, face-to-face, -face individualized activities, and at others across you know, immense uh, distances. But they are also often sites of power imbalances, riven through with race, class, gendered, and migration status um, dynamics. As an active engagement, care work is work that, as Fulbright puts it, involves connecting to other people, trying to help people meet their needs. Things um, like the work of caring for children, caring for the elderly, caring for sick people, or teaching is a form of caring labor. Some is paid, some is unpaid. Many faced heightened precarity due to poor labor regulation and increased exposure to injury and disability. And during the pandemic, many within the care labor sectors have faced an outsized risk of exposure to COVID-19. Undocumented uh, care workers who make up 20% of the essential workforce in the US are particularly vulnerable as they may be threatened with deportation. These and other exploitations of care laborers stem from the differentiations of racial capitalism at multiple entangled scales and map onto colonial uh, relations of racialized hierarchies of power. Um, and yet so much of the scholarship about care and care ethics is Euro or Western centric and lacks an intersectional analysis. So to care ethically then is to be conscientious of the ways in which our affective and active responses might most acutely attend to the stated needs of others, as opposed to our own need to feel like caring subjects, turning those for whom we care into objects of knowledge, ontologically negated into, into the interest of our own beingness. I want to make clear that what we are arguing is uh, not necessarily new. Um, and in fact, there is a very long tradition of care ethics within black feminism, uh, one that recognizes racial capitalism as the structure against which an ethic of care must be performed as an epistemological ground against which to exceed what Patricia Hill Collins calls the matrix of domination. Often grounded in other mothering and revolutionary mothering, Black feminist care ethics is rooted in the practices of women caring for children intergeneration, intergenerationally and across the community, a practice that stretches back to West Africa and to the times of enslavement. Other mothering uh, scholars such as Stanley James, Alana Butler, and Katrina Bell McDonald and others have reminded us is the revolutionary act of challenging Western conceptions of family and care and folding it into social and political activism. Black feminist care ethics begins from culture work, or as Regan puts it, the entire way a community organizes to nurture itself for future generations. Which is to say that other mothering is not simply the work of women, but rather is, as Alexis Pauline Gums, China Martins, and Maya Williams argue, the bridge work that requires confronting the very real barriers that oppression places in our way and also finding love and power by facing the barriers that divide us from each other across geopolitical divides. And in fact, caring is necessarily political, transformative and rooted in a collective uplift of those struggling to overcome these forces of oppression in their daily lives. And importantly, as we're arguing, this work is relational, it centers community. For Christina Sharp, this care uh, is bound up in wake work as she presses for thinking, quote, care in the wake as a problem for thinking and of and for black non-being in the world. This work is a work that insists and performs that thinking needs care. All thought is black thought and that thinking and care need to stay in the wake. So from this framing, care ethics opens up the possibilities for more complex frame of relationality based particularly in this moment of mutual vulnerability, a vulnerability which does not necessarily mean injurability, although that certainly can occur, um, but rather to be open to being transformed and to take seriously our responsibilities to each other. For a feminist care ethics to fulfill its promise as a transformative ethos and a relational ontology, it cannot treat differentiation as the object of study, but rather it must center race, racism and racial capitalism as the ground from which it emerges. So what then if care, if care geographies were to take seriously the role that racial capitalism has had on this current moment and to entangle it in its messy, fleshy and fraught formations and to become ethically attuned to these longer histories as they materialize today, both in this moment of crisis, as well as in the past, present, future. Ethical attunement 
disrupts universalizing our moral frameworks. It enables exploration, collective questioning, and the responsiveness that is tuned to the situation at hand. Care ethics offers a response to a normative frameworks such as deontological slash Kantian or even utilitarian ethics the posit and impartial and universalist approach to equity and justice. And it stands in contrast to what Joan Troncho calls neoliberalism's work ethic, which frames human relations in individualized and competitive terms. It begins with an ontology of relationality and interdependency. And, a, and this is a grounding which opens up possibilities for a more complex frame of livability. I like to show this just to kind of remind us of the ways in which um, sort of that appreciation for care workers emerged in those early weeks and months of the pandemic, we really saw this attention, like heightened attention to, um, to the need for care labor, labor for all of our survival. Um, uh, and we saw things like, uh, you know, Twitter exploded with comments about um, the worth of teachers and, you know, um, calls were made for hazard pay. We did see some of it for a short while um, and then it was quickly taken away. And then in Seattle, um, two clumsy C-17 Globe Master 3s flew over um, our healthcare facilities and places of interest around the region, uh, directed by our then president, um, as a quote, show of support to frontline healthcare workers in Operation America Strong. So this is the kind of response that we saw from the state in these moments, right? State, capital S, the U.S. As the immense and racial eth ethnic disparities of the pandemic came into clear view for a wider public, another form of risk appeared. Um, and this is the extrajudicial murder of black and brown people by police. If COVID-19 made plain the ways that systemic racial injustices bear down on individual bodies, um, the murder of George Floyd on May 25th highlighted the intensity with which some, the lives of some truly matter less to many. And across the US protests erupted. These were protests for the mattering of black lives, protests for the freedom to breathe, protests against the ontological negation and ontological terror that police brutality and racial capitalism produce. I'm reminded here of Franz Fanon's words when he said, we revolt simply because for a variety of reasons, we can no longer breathe. Indeed, a coronavirus survivor himself, Floyd, uh, cried out, I can't breathe more than 20 times, and it became the mantra of the protests. But the protests also sparked nationwide conversations about institutional racism, prompting a surge of cities to adopt the idea officially that racism is a public health crisis, spurred on perhaps by an open letter that was signed by more than 1,200 public health officials um, declaring racism a public health issue in June. To protest in the midst of the pandemic, that literally takes your breath away for the right to breathe free is to, in the words of Christina Sharp, aspire to do wake work as a mode of inhabiting and rupturing this episteme with our known lives and unimaginable lives. Still more protesters called for defunding police, making a concerted effort to move away from the masculinist sensibility of care as protection toward a more grounded form as, of redistribution as care model. Early in the pandemic, a Guardian article identified nearly 100 distinctly new methods of direct action that span both the physical and virtual worlds um, that popped up in those early, early months. Um, things like pop-up food banks, vacant home reclamation and occupation, crowdsourced hardship funds, free online medical consultation clinics, mass donations of surgical masks, gloves, gowns, goggles, and sanitizer. We had Zoom-based teach-ins, seminars on starting mutual aid networks, here at Dartmouth, um, student organizers rallied quickly to set up uh, aid funds, a mutual aid fund for low-income students, and they've already distributed around $60,000 since April 2020 to help with rent, food, and other costs. And disability advocates compiled a digital paper trail on Google Docs of all of the ways accommodations have been made for non-disabled people during the coronavirus pandemic as proof of um, that those accommodations can be achieved when there is a political will. In Seattle, um, protesters created the Capitol Hill occupied protest in Cal Anderson Park and the adjacent streets. It's about a six block radius. And it became a nodal point of care. Um, there was a food pantry set up, a free healthcare clinic that provided a full range of primary care services. Social workers provided outreach and made hundreds of points of contacts with houseless people and drug and alcohol dependent people. Clergy of all faiths held a spiritual center and mental health th uh, therapists volunteered their time and services for free. There were poetry readings, documentary screenings, a debate and discussion cafe, and even as you can see here, a community garden. 
volunteers passed out masks, hand sanitizers, and gloves, and we did not actually see um, a surge in COVID cases during the protests. And for a while, uh, many called it a festive atmosphere until it wasn't. Um, and we can talk about that in the QA if people are interested. We also saw on the national stage, the emergence of care as a major platform for presidential nominee, then nominee uh, Biden. Um, he actually invoked the care crisis on national television for the first time ever. But of course, in the first few months, uh, he's already begun to waver on his promises, faltering, for instance, on the fight for 15, the $15 an hour minimum wage, uh, refusing to open refugee resettlement, pushing the quote, the care portion of his economic plan out to come after his infrastructure plan, even though it was supposed to be part of the infrastructure plan, all reminding us that to care does not necessarily mean to care well. And indeed, Leo Hirsch cautions that there is a good reason both historically and contemporarily to be aware of the ways in which care may be a justification for political and cultural domination, given the way that sites and various forms of what was deemed care have so consistently been entangled with violence, trailing as they do in the wake, in the afterlife of slavery. And as Catherine Nash reminds us, Care is a practice for tending to what has already been lost and in what might be lost, a political tool for the maintenance of the self and the collective that is always oppositional to the logic of the state, and thus a practice of being deeply attuned to historical and ongoing violence and to living in the midst of it, a strategy for examining Black life and the structures that seek to constrain life. So as we set our sights on a post-vaccine COVID world, I wanna end by uh, thinking through the future archive of the present. What are the stories that we will tell about this past year of the 18 months that will have passed before vaccines have been distributed widely in the US, of the years it will take to distribute the vaccine globally? Will these numbers that we sit with today of 570,000 in the US alone, 3 million globally of the deaths we are seeing be just numbers? Will we remember as we look back as Catherine McKitchick puts it, quote, breathless at the archival numerical evidence that puts pressure on our present system of knowledge, end quote, or is it possible to move beyond the ordinariness that has settled and colonized the U.S.'s collective memory of the embodied experiences of expropriation and exploitation of Black, Indigenous, uh, people of color, to view this archive of the breathless, as Christina Sharp calls it, quite literally for what it is, an archive of the violence of and the vulnerability to premature death marshaled by racial capitalism. So thank you all for listening. Tish, thank you so much. Um, there's so much here to talk about and to think with, um, but thank you so much for putting the work together and, and, and bringing it to us. Um, I'd like to just open it up right now for questions or comments or thoughts um, for Tish. Um, yeah. And feel free to speak up, raise your hand, put anything in the chat, whatever modality works for you. So I see Pinar already has her hand up. So please go ahead. Um, hi, that, that was uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, I was really happy to see um, Christina Sharp's book brought up. She was one of my professors in undergrad, um, and that book had a huge, huge impact on me. Um, so I that was wonderful. And I, I was already, when I was reading um, the paper we were assigned for class, I was already seeing those connections. Um, so I actually wanted to ask you a question. I've asked a similar question to previous speakers in the series. So I am a healthcare policy student and CMU has, uh, there's a big push around data in my program. Um, and especially actually when it comes to like spaces of care. So something I wanted to ask you is like, how can students like myself who are in these master's programs where there is a norm or an expectation about how data is used, particularly to uphold racial capitalism, how can we um, find ways to, uh, at least like, you know, within our own programs or even just within our own classes, shift to using data towards those means to instead use data to actually fill out some of the 
uh, gaps that you were talking about in terms of being able to exemplify need in vulnerable communities um, to try to make the case that we, you know, policy cases that we should um, reimagine the way we fund or support these vulnerable communities. Tell me if that made sense. That absolutely makes sense. And it's something I think about a lot. Um, so I, I'm going to give you a very obtuse answer. I'm going to come around about because there is no perfect answer to this. Um, but it informs literally everything that I do. Um, uh, many years ago, before I went to graduate school, I worked at a children's clinic that had been built in Seattle through Model Cities Money. And if you don't know, it was a project that came out of the war on poverty, where so-called blighted communities could make a claim to federal funds bypassing all of the bureaucracy and have built whatever they, they, they had deemed they needed or wanted so long as they had um, could prove maximum feasible participation of the neighborhood that was being engaged, right? Um, the clinic still stands. Uh, it's a testament to that legacy. It was built by over a hundred uh, black and Asian community organizations um, across a range of actors. Um, and they needed that data. That data actually at that time was not available. They had to go into the community and, and create that data for themselves to prove the need for this clinic. So at that time, 76% uh, of African-Americans lived in nine census tracts in Seattle. They lived within two miles of 11 hospitals and they could not go to any of them, not a single hospital, because at that time, um, uh, there was a period of that during that period when, um, you know, now if you take federal funds, you have to see every, anybody who walks in the doors. Um, that was actually lifted for a handful of years and it was right when they were doing this study. So that being said, I very much draw from, and I think there is a way that we need to think about um, engaging with um, uh, decolonizing our methodologies and our methods, frankly. I mean, that's the simplest answer. The harder answer is how do you do that while negotiating these larger structures through which all of this is mitigated, militated, whatever, managed, right? Uh, these systems are set up explicitly and specifically um, to work the way that they do, which is to make it difficult, which is to make demands on how we think about data. Um, and so what we're seeing, and this is why I started with this clinic, is in Seattle, again, I, I love my, I love this city. It's such an amazing city. Um, so the, the children's clinic was linked to a larger hospital. The um, Carolyn Downs Clinic, which is the last surviving Black Panther uh, clinic was linked to another FQHC, Federally Qualified Health Center. For those of you who don't know, it's a particular kind of um, classification. Um, they both right now are in the process of delinking because what they're trying to do is actually take back their power to remove themselves from within these structures that are demanding that they perform in particular ways, right? Like clinic spaces in particular are the greatest neoliberal gatekeepers ever, particularly of people who live in poverty and who live on the margins. And what their entire purpose is, is to, to pull away from that and to disallow for themselves to be used in that way by the state and by sort of the ideological apparatuses, if you will, of neoliberalism more broadly, um, and to reclaim what their original intention was, which is to provide quality care with dignity to the populations as they, as the populations themselves declare that need. What do you do about this in policy? I struggle with this, right? I don't know if you've read Dean Spade's book um, on mutual aid, highly recommend it. It's, it's very, um, the language can be a little bit jarring, particularly if you're working within policy or nonprofit, but I think it's useful for shaking up how we think about things. This, this and as well as the Harriet Tubman um, uh, Freedom and Health program that is also coming out of Seattle right now is all about figuring out how do we actually just delink ourselves? Right? Like, how do we actually remove ourselves from those systems? Because as long as we continue to respond to them, they're going to continue to have that kind of power. And this is a bigger question that I have with my students, and I've had it with the former director of the clinic. You know, it's like, are you for incremental change or are you for the revolution? And I'm like, can I be for both? Right? Like, those incremental changes that are occurring where they are occurring are you know, really stop gaps against the extremity of the violence against particularly racialized people um, while the rest of us are busy fomenting the revolution, right? I think they need to happen in tandem um, so that there's also this greater preparation that we see through education. And this is why I think the mutual aid book is useful because his whole thing, what he's trying to explain and get across to us, you know, mutual aid societies in the US stretch back um, to um, populations of the enslaved. 
right? They're grounded in that. And the first record is, is 1780, but they actually um, existed well before that. They're grounded in an, um, indigenous ontologies of relationality, right? That you care for each other. Um, that they have to be sites of education as well. They have to be these sort of um, anti-racist, feminist, decolonial sites of education in the midst of also doing the very difficult work of both collecting that data and protecting that data and making that data do the work that you need it to do to build what it is that you're looking for. All right, I'll stop talking. I'm very passionate about this. Thank you. That was that was really great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tish. Can you guys hear me? Oh, good. Okay, my computer is frozen. So this is just a little caveat that in case I free, I can hear you and see you and I guess I'm still on, but I can't do anything. Um, something is happening here. Anyway, um, thank you so much, Tish. May I just invite someone else to ask another question? I've got a, a, a sort of unformed question, and um, I'm wondering whether we can uh, go through a kind of uh, overturning of normality. And I don't see normal as uh, ha having any benefit at all, but the, uh, the kind of interruption of something which might be expected. Um, is this, uh, do you feel an opportunity for us to uh, uh, seek change? Or are we in, uh, so kind of blinded by dealing with a change over the last um, year that there, you know, I think it's hard to be radical in a moment when you feel you've lost your bearings. So that's a, you know, it's a, quite an open question. I think it's a fantastic question. And I think it's a very fair question. And I actually think it's a question that we can all respond to actually. And I would love to hear what people have to say. Um, but for myself, I, this is, um, I get, we are exhausted. All of us are exhausted and I cannot take that away from anybody. Um, and it's a question my students have posed to me a few times, you know, where are the professors? And I'm like, oh, oh, yeah, <laughs> let me, let me tell you, like, we are fighting, but we're exhausted. Um, and I, I've never seen such, um, uncoordinated, um, sort of responses from the faculty ever. I mean, Dartmouth College, the faculty, when something happens, we're on top of it, but yeah, it's, we're exhausted. So I, that's where I, I absolutely get that question about radicalism. I think um, on the other side of that is, and this has been particularly true in Seattle, um, is that this exhaustion has also sparked um, in, in some ways a tipping point for many people where it was already so untenable to be living in the systems within which we were already embedded. And COVID made us realize, it made many people realize it's not just untenable, it is actually so violent that we, that literally people of color are dying at, mm -hmm. you know, at these outrageous rates. I've seen greater radicalization, um, particularly around healthcare in the black community in Seattle in the last um, 12 months than I ever thought I would see. Um, particularly coming out of a couple of these clinics and some of the organizing that's coming out of um, sort of uh, these other organizations around that. Uh, I think, you know, if you look at it biophysically, and this is also something that I'm thinking about with my colleague, um, Abigail Neely, is all of the sort of heightened um, uh, hormone responses that we're all experiencing is also leading to ex not just this exhaustion, but also um, brain fog, right? Um, mm -hmm. Sort of this, um, I can't think of the word, I, it's not laziness, but l l never mind. Also <laughs> happening to me right now, um, right? Our inability to really sort of formulate and, and construct. But I think what we're all doing is finding different ways of um, 
of not just coexisting and, and sort of surviving, but there are other forms of flourishing happening, right? So what our larger project is we're interviewing people about care labor, about their everyday care labors. And what we're finding is people are making radical changes to their lives. Absolutely yeah. radical. On the one hand, we see, um, we've seen a surprising number of divorces. We've also seen on the other, a surprising number of people jumping into relationships after two or three months moving in together. We've seen people completely just dropping their jobs and taking off and other people ratcheting up their career paths, right? Um, I, I don't know how to interpret that. I think what we need, I'm, I'm excited about this work is that it's opening up this realization that we're, we are all also dealing with the stress very differently, right? Like I've been more productive than I've ever been as an academic in the last 12 months, which I am not in the demographic for which that is true. Looking at all the data, women's uh, publication submissions dropped drastically over COVID and men's shot up. Like in the first two months, men's went up by 50%, women's dropped by 90%. Women have come color in particular have dropped drastic, right? Like I, we are leaving the academy in droves. We're just all having our own experience. And I think that's, you know, there, I don't think any of us should feel like we're supposed to be feeling particularly radical. I think we all are doing what we can to make it through this and, and support each other in this. Sorry, that's much of an answer. I, I'm curious about what other people think. Yeah, if others have thoughts. I'm most concerned that the um, forces of capital um, accumulation are only uh, and increasing through the changes of market and that it goes through health in an extraordinary way because uh, how, how much are we being dominated by uh, and dependent upon an industry of drugs? And so the, the, this um, shift has excused an enormous amount of concentration power. And uh, that's concerning. Absolutely. And I agree. And capitalism is doing what it will always do in any crisis. It's finding out ways to reproduce itself you know, in sort of exponential ways. What is different, I feel like this time, maybe not totally different, we saw something somewhat similar in Occupy in 2011 coming out of the 2008 economic crisis um, is uh, greater um, care, honestly. You know, the what happened in Seattle with CHOP with that entire setup, Seattle was not the only city that had that. They were happening all over the world, actually. Um, they just didn't get the same kind of coverage as Seattle. I was getting phone calls from everybody. Are you alive? I'm like, I'm fine. I'm, I'm down there volunteering, um, right? Like there's, it's a very, um, there, it, both are happening at the same time. And I think that's so why I, I put so much focus on what is happening, because I think one of the things is that we are limited in, in our energies. It's not like I'm not paying attention. I promise I am. I can't help myself to what's happening with the capital accumulation. Um, but also how do we continue to foster the excitement and the desire for immense political change, uh, you know, immense social change, and also just the ways in which we engage with each other. I, I've really, I've seen both ends, right? You've seen it with your, your colleagues of faculty of like some faculty are bending over backwards and making life easier. And some faculty are like, oh, you've got all this extra time, here's extra homework, you know? <laughs> and, you know, oh, fit it in. So it's, I, I think, when things settle, I'm hopeful, I guess, is my, my takeaway. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Seish. Yeah, I think those those fears are all, all, always there also in the back. We were, my class, we were reading um, those two pieces by uh, Michele Lancioni and uh, Abdul Malik Simon about bio, um, bio, it's like bio, biological austerity, but I, I can never, the, the, the word that they use, uh, biotherapy, um, and how sort of, you know, like on both, on all these ends, right? Because these kind of pandemics and epidemics tend to have a particular crisis form that works on the biological body that seeks to individualize on top of all of the kind of other structures that you've, you know, detailed so nicely here. Um, so, but I really, really appreciate this kind of idea to kind of keep also focusing on what is going on um, and, and, and keep building on it and to it and, and 
through it. Um, yeah, other questions for Tish or other thoughts on, on, on what she said? Uh, I'm from a urban design background, so I'm curious about have you ever find any like spatial patterns in your study? And also I think it's encouraging to see like uh, those mutual aids and bottom up care activities happening during this pandemic. And I'm also curious about if there's any spatial patterns of that, like where are those happening? Oh, those are interesting questions. Um... In terms of the spatial patterns, do you mean the spatial patterns of disease more generally? Um, so what has been peculiar about um, how the spatial patterns of COVID has emerged, particularly among racialized um, populations, uh, has been it that it hasn't just been urban centers, right? Like with the other, what is this, the fifth SARS, I believe? Um, to emerge in the last 20 years. Um, with the others, they tended to occur at transit sites, hotels, urban centers, right? In very crowded conditions that we think of as more urban um, sort of framed. But this disease in particular, and I'm thinking about Washington because that's what I was following the closest at the beginning. You know, obviously we saw the emergence in nursing homes, but we started to see it almost immediately in farm workers. Um, and in uh, people who worked in meat processing plants. Um, and to the extent that Trump actually declared meat processing an essential um, labor and good in this country, which I never thought would happen. You know, it's like farming, I understand, but the meat processing plants, I was very confused by um, because they're very difficult to actually change those configurations to allow for proper social distancing. The air circulation is not great, et cetera. I think um, you said you're an urban planner, is that correct? Oh. So one of the things that has been coming out, and I, this is not my area of expertise, and I, I think my colleague, Abby Neely, would be able to speak to this better, is Michelle Murphy's work around sick building syndrome has suddenly just blown up in, in sort of the this understanding about the buildings in which we work and live, right? That we've always had it in the back of our minds, but now more than ever, it's been sort of in this uh, very heightened sensibility around this, that COVID is going, this is going to be a big problem with COVID and returning to work, et cetera. And then also now I'm never going back to my office because I just finally read the book after 20 years of people telling me to read it. I was like, no, um, I have windows that don't open, right? Like the very simple things of like opening a window, having an air filtration system. Our building was built in the 1970s. They were like, who needs fresh air? Even though we live in the rural countryside. Um, so I think in that sense, what we're, one of the big things they found like in New York, for instance, which is fascinating was the buildings that were built at the turn of the century, sort of early 20th century, were actually built with radiators that run too hot. So if you've ever been in, um, a walk up in New York in the winter and the radiators and you're sweltering, you have to open the windows. That was actual purposeful, um, design that was built in to force people to open the windows to keep the air circulating through winter because otherwise people would keep them closed. And you know you have no control of your radiators in New York. And so this was all part of like sort of putting health into not just the built environment, but the environment of the home um, as an urban sort of health thing, which I, I'm so fascinated by that story. I was like, what, this is amazing. I now want my radiators back. Um, and you had, oh, in terms of this question around mutual aid, you know, I, I think that would make a great research project because I've been hearing more and more about these different ways in which people have created mutual aid societies through things like neighborhood pods. You know, we talked about the family pods and sort of community pods, whatever, but the neighborhood pods have been really instrumental in um, building up mutual aid societies that, you know, where, and even in Seattle, I was on next door. Um, people would say, I've got free time. Does anybody need me to go and get the groceries? Um, other people were putting up lists of their phone numbers on the, in the stairwells, just saying like, I live in this building. If you get sick, call me. Um, I would be curious to see how, what that kind of spatialization looks like. I've, that's not something we've looked into, uh, but I do think it's a great question. Um, yeah, there's actually um, this new term in Canada, and it's called it's care mongering. It didn't take off in the U.S. I was I was going to try to make it take off in the U.S. and it just I couldn't quite. Uh, but care mongering was basically um, a term that encompassed all of the different kinds of mutual aid that people were providing, whether it was through like an organized um, system or disorganized or whatever. Um, highly recommend if you're ever like looking up, but. Yeah, I hadn't heard that term. Um, 
I, I was hoping it meant something different. I was like, this is the best term ever, but yeah. Um, I wanted to ask, um, I'm kind of curious about the field of care ethics before COVID and before 2020, actually, um, before movements on Black Lives Matter and Asian hate and all that. Um, and also, what are your thoughts on um, care ethics? So before and now also during the time when collectivism and uh, working together is actually unsafe for a lot of people where like gathering and individuality is like supposed to be protected. So um, yeah, those are kind of two questions. <laughs> Um, they're, they're great questions. I actually teach a class on care ethics. Um, uh, I, I built it off of Saviki so Lawson, started teaching this in 2011, um, and I had the great pleasure and honor to TA for her for the first two iterations, and then I reproduced it here at Dartmouth. Um, the first thing is the really obvious thing, just sort of in a really sort of instrumental academic-y frame. <laughs> it used to take me weeks to convince students that the work that they were doing working at the food dining services or at the library was care labor. To get, it just took forever because we were so closed off to this idea of care labor, right? Or as, you know, what we now call essential labor, although that also includes some things that are not very caring. Um, and this term, I'm teaching it this term, I, I, the work is so much easier. I've, I've been able to skip the long sort of arduous conversations about what counts as care. Your question though is about care ethics. And I think um, I have a lot of thoughts about this and I will try to temper these in a way that is um, not as fervently and fiery as I usually <laughs> say things. One of my concerns about care ethics and has always been one of my concerns is it's, it's whiteness. It is, it is very, very much middle-class white lady project, right? Yeah, and I, I don't mean that pejoratively, I just mean in terms of, of its scope and thinking and the ability to engage with things like racial capitalism. Um, and and I'll, I'll give you an example. So Parvati, there's a, a, um, a care conference every two years um, now in the US and um, Parvati Rigram about two years ago sent out a call, does anybody wanna do something on care and race? And I was the only person in the entire network of a couple thousand care ethics folks who responded to her. Um, you know, so that sort of gives you a, a sense of its, um, how it was, it was engaging with race, but the way that I call it is the ampersand of capitalism, right? So it's um, uh, capitalism and race. Uh, the ways in which it's racialized labor, um, the ways in which, you know, it's always about the sort of the object of study um, or was quite often the object of study rather than the subject of study, which is why this, where this work comes from, the, um, the article that some of you read and then all, this article that I drew part of this talk from is really trying to actually say, no, uh, this is what produced this moment, right? And to think care ethically, um, I still very much adhere to Joan Tronto's um, framework for thinking about that. And, but what I see in that as I'm thinking through it now, um, and as I teach it is through um, indigenous ontologies, you know, through uh, a black feminist framework, through like these broader processes that are grounded in something like pluriversalism, right? Thinking about worlds beyond, within worlds um, and it, making it more of a transformative ethos rather than a normative ethics, if that makes sense, right? So instead of it being, and this is what makes it very difficult, instead of it being a set of rules, like we see with Kantianism or utilitarianism about how you are ethical or not, I see it as a set of processes that allow us to actually constantly be in this um, sort of relationship with those with whom we are in caring relationships, right? Always checking in, always asking, always coming back, building an actual relationship as opposed to setting out rules of engagement and then we've done our work and it's therefore ethical. Um, I, I've, I've had some struggle in the past, I think pre-COVID trying to help people to understand that there isn't an answer. <laughs> In my classes, I'm, I guess I should just talk in my classes. Um, but I, you know, in the last year and all of my classes, um, I'm seeing a much more comfortability with with the sort of uncomfortability of not having a pet answer. Mm -hmm. And I think COVID has made us have to become comfortable with precarity and uncertainty in ways that none of us like. 
but also makes us realize um, that this is always a shifting terrain against which we have to consider each other uh, more fully. I, I hope that answers your question. It's sort of a little bit winding, but yeah. Thank you, Tish. I have, I mean, I have questions, but I would like to keep it open since we have a few more minutes, if anyone else wants to chime in. Okay, maybe then I'll. <laughs> um, you mentioned Victoria Lawson, and um, I was thinking uh, when you were presenting also, um, when you mentioned um, that whole thing about how, um, especially Black and Latinx Americans being called on to kind of take responsibility for their own health, for such. And, you know, public health has a long history of responsibilization in different ways, right? Of a kind of individualized, atomized responsibilization that it's, and, and on some levels, it, those things also build up to a social thing, right? Like mask wearing is an individual act, but it performs a sort of, ser, uh, performs a role within a community and has a sort of community role. So I'm wondering, you know, how in your conceptualization of care as relational, how does that intersect with ideas of responsibility also as either, you know, as this kind of one form which is directed. Um, in my own dissertation, I write about it as vectorized because I was thinking about um, vector-borne diseases. And then as, as distributed relational, which Doreen Massey and Victoria Lawson's work sort of teaches us about. Um, you know, it's a really uh, excellent question. Thank you. Um, and this is something I come back together. So I'll get, I'll tell you another story. I have a student right now working on a thesis, um, looking at the lived experiences of Muslim American women under COVID. Um, and she and I have talked about this extensively. And for her, in her work, what her finding is, and I, I've been trying to figure out how I can bring her work actually into thinking with ours. Um, within Islam, it, that responsibility is community, right? Like, and, I, and I, I've been trying to think about how do we think about that in, within our context? As feminists, obviously, that is a no-brainer, right? Like, there was never a question of wearing or not wearing, um, that the responsibility is to all of us. But that, that responsibility um, is, I think, and this is what I've been trying to unpack um, for the last several months, is... Um, that responsibility, which is informed by what? And I think that's that's the piece that keeps not being sort of drawn on when we have these conversations. That the responsibility keeps being about what the act is rather than what is informing the act. Um, and so for those who don't wanna wear the mask, it's being informed by you know, a particular like late liberal sensibility about freedom. Um, versus those who do wear the mask is being informed by an ethic of relationality. So that I think, I've been trying to think about this in ontological terms lately about how we understand um, uh, what it means to be in relation at all, mm -hmm. right? For me to be in relation is to be responsible at all times. Um, but for others, you know, and I think it's that individualization of responsibility, it actually, um, takes away even that that acknowledgement. And I always come back to Franz Fanon, right? It's like sort of the ontological negation um, of in his son, in his writing of, of the black man. Um, but I think more broadly, I, I, it's almost like I'm really struggling to unpack this. So probably shouldn't be saying this out loud, but thank you for asking the question. Um, sort of an ontological negation of everything that is not me, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's what neoliberalism did. Thatcherism, I mean, Thatcher's whole, there is no such thing as society, only individual men and women and their families. Like it did so much work. And she literally says um, in, I think it's in 1982, she said, the market part of neoliberalism is only a small piece of it. The bigger and most important piece is the reconfiguration of the soul. I mean, she was no dummy, right? Like she knew that this was about like something much deeper than just a set of policies, um, but was, and even I would say more than ideologies and almost into an ontological reconfiguration of how we understand what it means to be human, yeah. actually. Yeah. And exist yeah. at self and society, yeah, relationship. Yeah. And I, this is why I like care ethics, right? It, it 
provides within the sort of academic framework, it provides a language with which to respond to neoliberal ethics mm -hmm. um, in a way that isn't really available, I think, in sort of a broad, broad, like broader Western liberal ontology, if you will, sort of coming out of enlightenment. Yeah. Thank you. Any other thoughts or, I mean, there's so much here to sit with and think with and, and thank you for opening up these concepts and, and sharing so generously and also all your experiences in Seattle. And I mean, that was also extremely rich to hear about, you know, the kind of that perspective from being on the ground and, and, and put, positioning that alongside the kind of the bigger numbers, statistics and data that we've, you know, all heard about, but often sometimes, you know, in these chunks which are separated from 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 what's going on um, yeah yeah and i you know i will always want to tell people like write your experiences down keep a diary like these diaries are going to be so important in, mm -hmm. and I, I was just today was thinking oh my goodness i am so excited for the first dissertation that i get of somebody writing about the you know experience of covid just generally but um yeah, I'm such, I think about these kinds of things a lot, but I do encourage everyone to keep a diary about what you're thinking, feeling, and experiencing, because I think we all have a very, very rich trove of, of grounded stories from which to draw. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. And thank you everyone who's here and who's been here. Um, we'll get this talk um, online um, so that others can also listen and, and um, thank you also, um, Tish, for making that available to us um, beyond today. So and thank you, uh, everybody, for listening and for your great questions. I really appreciate it. It was so nice to, to get to do this with you. So, yeah. Thank you all. Have a good afternoon. Good day. Bye bye.